Good evening. Uh, my name is Doug Shackford. It's my honor and privilege to serve as the Dean of UNC Kenyon Flagler. Welcome to tonight's lecture, which is our first Dean Speaker Series for the academic year. The Dean Speaker Series was created to bring to our campus outstanding scholars and leaders from the field of business, education, and government to share thoughts and insights with UNC Kenyon Flagler, the university, and the community at large. It is managed primarily by our students who select and invite the leaders that are most interesting for, to learn from. The Dean Speaker Series is made possible through support of the Archer K, Archie K. Davis Endowment. It is one of the many wonderful Kenan Flagler events made possible through gifts to the business school from our loyal alumni and friends. As you know, each inch of this campus and this school benefits from the generosity of those who have come before us. Private giving is critically important in our attempt to provide world-class learning opportunities for our business students. Tonight, I hope you will consider making a gift to Kenyon Flagler to facilitate that. Immediately following tonight's speech, we will have members of our advancement staff just outside the, in the foyer who will be prepared to take your gifts. <laughs> At the conclusion of the lecture, Dr. Jerry Bell, adjunct professor of organizational behavior and CEO and founder of Bell Leadership Institute, will deliver a voice of thanks to our speaker on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students. I would also like to remind everyone of our next Dean Speaker event. On Monday, November 17th, we will host Jeff Saturday, our own Kenan Flagler undergraduate from 1997, and uh, all-pro NFL player, member of the 2007 Super Bowl champion Indianapolis Colts, and current football analyst for ESPN. Registration uh, information for this event will be coming your way in the next few weeks. Now I am happy to welcome tonight to UNC Kenan Flagler, Chuck Swoboda. Chuck is the chairman and chief executive officer of Cree Inc., where he and Cree are leading the LED lighting revolution to obsolete the incandescent light bulb through the use of energy efficient, environmentally friendly LED lighting. We're particularly delighted to welcome Chuck this year as we celebrate the 15th year of our highly regarded Center for Sustainable Enterprise. Chuck joined Cree in 1993, and during his time, the company has grown from $6 million in annual revenue to $1.4 billion. Cree has created nearly 1,000 jobs in North Carolina over the last decade, and nearly 7,000 worldwide. In 2010, he was named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year for the Carolinas. Cree was also recognized by Forbes magazine as one of America's 25 fastest growing tech companies for 2013. Chuck and his wife, Karen, who is also joining us tonight, are actively involved with Habitat for Humanity, the V Foundation, and the North Carolina Food Bank. Chuck earned his engineering degree from Marquette University. Please join me in giving a warm Carolina welcome to Chuck Swoboda. Well, first of all, thank you all for uh, having me here, Dean. I appreciate the invitation and for you taking the time. Um, you know, as, uh, as a company that uh, grew up here in North Carolina, we certainly didn't think in the beginning that any of us would ever be had the chance to come speak at a business school, let alone the Carolina Business School, especially because we were all from NC State back then. So, um, although honestly, I am not. I've adopted it, but that was only because I had a choice. I could either root for state when I got there or get fired. So uh, I'm very much of a pragmatist. So, so with that, uh, you know, being the CEO of Cree gives me a chance to talk about what we've done as a company. And we've really had an amazing journey. And hopefully I can share a few things there today that will maybe give you some ideas and inspire you. Because you know, it's, it's great to talk about our story. But what I hope most of you get is that it can be replicated. It's possible. It can be done again. 
So I love to share with people, you know, a little bit of insights in that journey and hopefully give some of you, especially those students in the audience, a chance to think about how you might do the same thing at some point in the future. Um, the other thing I need to tell you is that, uh, yes, I'm the CEO and I've been doing this for, uh, as CEO for a little over 13 years, but I'm really just the spokesperson for an incredibly amazing group of people. You know, Cree was founded by uh, some really uh, great entrepreneurs and from the work they did in the beginning to the fact that we have 7,000 employees who if they don't come in every day, come up with new ideas, find ways to take on those challenges, we can't do what we do. So I'll take some credit today and tell you some stories and hopefully some of them are interesting. But uh, really the credit goes to everyone else and it's probably, if I had to say there's one thing about our company that's made it last and continue to grow, is that one of our core values is Cree is we. And uh, you know, a lot of people throw around nice words like that, but it actually is what we mean. It's, uh, it is an absolute team effort. We require a lot of people to do amazing things each day, and so please keep that in mind. So I'll take some credit on behalf of everyone else. Um, for those of you who don't know the story, so Cree, 1987, uh, two brothers and three scientists at NC State decide to get together to found a company to commercialize silicon carbide semiconductors. And that was really exciting for them, and most people had never heard of what they were talking about. And uh, they decide in the fall of that year, in addition to one gentleman from MCNC, we're going to form the company. And on a Friday, they had arranged their original financing. Fortunately, this was October of 1987, and some of you might remember on a Monday in October of 1987, the stock market crashed. So literally, in what was going to be their first week of business, they had no money. And it's a great story because what they decided to do is, okay, so the two brothers got together, one of them went out and got a second mortgage, and the other one pyramided credit cards. And they raised $28,000, and that's actually the starting capital of Cree. And I love to tell that story. I wasn't there when they did this, but I love to tell the story because I think that attitude, that passion that every problem is solvable, if one thing doesn't work, let's pursue the next one, is the reason I get to stand here today and talk about all the neat things we're doing in the markets. And so to me, it's always a great story. And it also is one that I think that humble beginning of never really having the capital to do what we wanted to in the beginning is probably the reason we've invested it so conservatively over the years and have given ourselves the chance to pursue some really hard technology, which took a lot longer to get to this point. Um, today, or 1993, Cree went public. And so some people don't know that uh, it had only six million of revenue and about 30 employees. I like to say that uh, it was a concept IPO before that was a common idea. And so $5 million was government R&D and $1 million was selling products. And they had a choice. And the choice was, we need more money. We've raised all the money over the first six years from friends, family, friends of friends, anyone who would give them money that wasn't a professional investor. And literally, this was all friends and family rounds. And their idea was we need more money to keep pursuing the technology and at the same time, we're not sure we want to do venture capital. And so there was venture capital available, but the challenge the founders knew at the time was they would have to give up control. And uh, as one of them later described it to me, you know, when you're looking for capital, you got to figure out, is the capital going to match the patience that's going to be required by your business? And what they realized is venture capital actually isn't very patient. The public markets were going to be more, and so that's the path they went down, despite the fact that I don't know that it was a unanimous decision at the time. So the company goes public in 1993, and we're off. Today, that has turned into $1.65 billion in revenue. Over the last 10 years, we've averaged over 20% compound annual growth per year. We got a market cap of somewhere, I didn't check the stock price today, somewhere over $5 billion, I hope, still, um, depending on what the market's doing. And we have 7,000 employees. Um, probably, those employees are around the world, but probably the most fun part, especially when I get to talk in North Carolina, almost 2,600 of those employees are here in the state of North Carolina, and another 1,200 are in Wisconsin. So over half of our employees in a technology business that is very global in scale is actually here in the United States. And it's been very helpful to Cree to do that because frankly, it made us relevant in a time when so many other companies weren't doing that. And when you're a small company, and I'll come back to this, you're looking for any story to give you publicity. Because the fact is, you can't afford to raise the awareness for a new company in all the traditional ways. And so it became one of the many good stories that we were able to leverage along the way. 
Uh, I joined the company in 1993, shortly after the IPO. I'm an engineer from Marquette University, and uh, so I'm not sure how that qualifies me to run a business, but when I got to Cree, I was the one that knew the most about selling LEDs, and that's really why I joined the company. And, you know, when you get to a small company, remember, this is a company that when I did the interview, they would not allow me in the building, because if I didn't join them, they figured Hewlett Packard was gonna compete with them someday in the future. So I'm this guy from Silicon Valley, and they can't trust you. So you have to basically say yes before you can actually go in the door. And so after a, a long, I'll make a long story, eventually I decide to say yes and I moved to North Carolina. And on my first day, I really got a different picture of what working for a small startup company was. So you walk in and they say, hey, welcome to Cree, it's great to have you. Come on, we'll show you're gonna sit. And I walk in and there's a small office and in the office there's three boxes on the floor and a Mac Classic computer. And the Mac Classic's plugged into the wall, and the three boxes are your desk, your chair, and your bookshelf. And your first job is put together your stuff if you want to sit on something. <laughs> and so literally my first half day of employment at Cree was putting together O'Sullivan office furniture on the floor of my office. Um, honestly, I didn't know if it was some kind of a test. Can a market engineer do this or not? I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> I passed, I got it together, and that desk lasted me a long time. I used a lot of glue. Um, so that's kind of how the morning started. So then the afternoon I go in and we talk about the business, and what they failed to disclose to me was is that when they went public with that five million in government R&D and one million of customer sales, the main customer no longer wanted any LEDs. And so I also learned on my first day that my job was to go find some customers, because we didn't have any anymore, at least not for the LED products. And so it's a humbling beginning, and uh, it really kind of set in stone, I think, a theme that we've continued on. And for those of you who are college basketball fans, and you might hear a few references, because I'm a huge one, um, there is something during March Madness called survive and advance. And you just do what it takes to get through that game, win, and you can play the next one. Literally, on that first day of Cree, we defined what survive and advance meant in a company. And there are so many times over the years that we've had to rely on that attitude to keep going. And it's really, it's really provided a, a great context for, for the company. The other thing I learned early on that I found really interesting was is in the very beginning, there was this amazing passion for shareholder value. And now this is a word that gets used, overused, frankly, a lot. And this is not to say that stakeholders aren't important. Yes, customers, employees, the community, these are all critical to any organization's success. But what the company knew in the very beginning was the only way you can ever really take care of all those stakeholders is if you have an effective business. The end of the day, if the shareholders are being taken care of, you have all the assets in the world to invest in everyone else. And if you ever forget that piece, your chance of handling all the other stakeholders goes away pretty quickly. And, and I like to mention that because even after 13 plus years as a public company CEO, it's only become more apparent to me. And not in the bad way, in the good way. And I think if most businesses would keep in mind that you have to take care of those shareholders if you want to keep going, it would turn on a lot better. So enough about me. How did a company that's going to invent silicon carbide decide to become an LED lighting company? And I had a chance to meet with some great students ahead of time, and they said, you know, you kind of keep looking like you're competing with your customers. Is that really a good business strategy? Most of us would not recommend that here in the business school. Okay, well, I agree. Generally, I wouldn't recommend you compete with your customers either. But when you're in the technology business, you basically are forced, you're inventing things that no one has yet decided they want. And so you can't, sell a product if there's no market for it, and if none of your customers want to buy it or go do what it takes to invent that product, you have to do it yourself. So from early on, from blue LED chip company that had to make packaged LEDs to packaged LED company to getting the lighting business, we were forced to figure out, it's great to invent it, but it doesn't matter if there's no market. So we decided we would fit, find ways to, um, to basically invent it ourselves. And the other trick to that is, when you're talking to those customers, and probably the best example is in 2006. So we invent the world's first lighting class LED. And some of you in the audience I know work at Korea, and you're laughing because we made up that name. It sounded good at the time. But what it was is an LED that truly lasted longer than any traditional light source and was more efficient. 
And we thought this was going to be obvious. Wouldn't everyone want to buy one? So we said, great. We spent the next two years visiting with every major lighting company. And we said, don't you want to make LED lighting fixtures? And they were like, well, no. <laughs> what do you mean? It's the perfect light source. It uses less energy. It lasts a really long time. It pays for itself. Of course you want one of these. No. Well, well why not? Well, our customers aren't asking for them. What do you mean? Your customer's never seen one. Well, right, but if they're not asking for them, I'm certainly not going to spend any of my budget going down that path and trying to figure that out. So eventually the market will figure it out. Someone will do something, but we, don't, we really can't afford to do this. And so we really intended in the beginning to sell LEDs to other lighting companies. Unfortunately, what we learned along the way is there weren't going to be any customers. I like to say we were very successful. We had 100% share of the market. There just wasn't any market. <laughs> so you realize that, you know, I'm picking on those companies, but they actually have a pretty normal innovation problem. You, it's very hard to ask a customer what the demand is for something or what they would like if they've never seen it or experienced it. So much of what we answer questions on is about experience. We've seen it. We've tried it. How do you ask someone if they want a light bulb that never burns out? They, they frankly had no experience with that. And as much as that seems like a logical question today because we're making LED light bulbs, it was completely illogical at the time to the point where I did a conference in the early 2000s where I said someday we're going to do, as a company, we're going to create solid state lighting for every application. And every major light bulb company in the world CEO was there and he got up and said, it's nice those young guys want to do that. It'll never happen. There's no reason. No one wants a better light bulb. And you start to realize this is the classic technology problem. And if you start to study, and what I did at the time is started to figure out, were we like making this up as we went along? It, what you actually learn in looking at all the successful technology businesses, this is the classic problem. You have to find some way to break through this part of the market. So we decided to get into the LED lighting business. We bought a local company that was started by some ex-Cree guys. And the reason they started the company is because we weren't going to make LED lighting fixtures. So they left and started the company. Well, two years later, we changed our mind and decided we were going to have to get into the business to move to market. And the idea was, if the industry could see LED lighting, of course they'll want to do it. So essentially, we would get into their business. Now, to some of you students who I met earlier, yes, we were competing with our customers, but not really if they're not making any LED lighting. And that was my argument back to them. Um, that's not how they all felt, but that was the argument we made back. And so we had to figure out where we're going to focus, and we said commercial lighting. So why would we pick commercial lighting over light bulbs or something else? And the reason we did that is, is that if you look at the market, about three quarters of all lighting is in buildings, commercial building, industrial buildings, things like that. And we figured they'd be really motivated because 30 to 40% of the electricity in most commercial buildings is used for the lighting. And with LED lighting, we knew what the technology would do. We could cut that number in half. So these people will get it, right? This is our idea. We can convince them to buy LED lighting. Now, that's a harder problem than you might think because, remember, they don't know they want it. So yes, it pays for itself. Yes, it's going to save them a bunch of energy. But they've never heard of Cree. So we've got this great idea, this big market, this great technology. But we're trying to go out and sell to an industry that has never heard of our company. And so you have this huge credibility gap. The other thing we decided at the time is we weren't going to make LED light bulbs. And some of you in the audience will laugh a little more than others because you work for the company. But I was the guy who said, for sure, we're not making LED light bulbs. And that's going to get funnier here in about two minutes. But uh, <laughs> so why not? So smaller market. Consumers generally are first cost based. They're not payback based. There was no good logical reason people were going to pay $10, $20 for an LED light bulb when they were buying one for a dollar today. So if we couldn't convince the commercial markets, why the heck would we be able to converse, convince consumers? Second, we didn't know anything about selling to consumers. So we decided, you know what, we're not doing it. And I made it very clear. In fact, we made sure we weren't going to work on this. And at the end of the day, what I said is, it's this simple. There's no money to be made in light bulbs. And so up until March of last year, that was completely true. And so now I know someone says, suppose you got the video. This is what we did in March of last year. So if you guys can run the video. Mr. Edison, 
Today we lay to rest your creation, the incandescent light bulb. I know you're not shocked, sir. You knew that it needed an unreasonable amount of energy to do its job and that it had the lifespan of a lucky bug. Being as tireless as you were, you must have known that it would someday be improved upon and made obsolete. So that is why this is not a sad day. It is a celebration. The Cree LED bulb is a worthy successor. It lasts 25 times longer and uses a fraction of the energy of your invention. So it is time. Good night, sweet prince. The Cree LED bulb. The biggest thing since the light bulb. So basically, what we decided to do is become an LED light bulb company. And the reason I love to use this ad is, is that what he's talking about is how crazy an idea it is that we buy light bulbs that burn out. And so essentially, we're bearing Thomas Edison's invention. And if you haven't seen the ad, it's on our website. And you go, wow, that's a pretty aggressive way to go out. Why would you do that? And the reason we had to take this approach is we're the guy no one ever heard of. And so we've got to create a story that's so different, so unexpected to get people's attention. But more importantly, why would a company that wasn't going to make an LED light bulb, a CEO said, we're absolutely not doing it. And by the way, I was serious at the time, decide to start selling LED light bulbs at the Home Depot. And I love to share the story because it's actually the point of Cree. It's just the latest example. One of the things we've learned is that if you're not prepared to change what you're doing, adapt to new information, look at how the markets evolve from what you thought, and keep moving, you become irrelevant pretty fast. If you look at most of the great technology businesses that stopped growing, there's lots of stories of why, but most of it is they forgot to keep inventing things. You've got to keep changing. You've got to keep innovating. And so in our case, we had to be prepared to take a different path. And in our case, it was quite coincidental. So what we knew at the time was we were selling LEDs to light bulb companies, but not many people were buying them. And when we studied the market, what we found is, is that people were confused. They'd go to buy an LED light bulb, and they'd look at them, and they would look at all the different choices, and lots of choices, and they would buy none of them. And the reason they bought none of them is they were confused. It's a, what's known in the retail business as an unshoppable category. So essentially, they had too much choice that was too different. They didn't know what to do, so they would keep on walking by. And while we knew this, we were trying to figure out how to help our customers sell more light bulbs. So our idea right up until this moment is we're going to teach them how to sell light bulbs better. Well, let me just tell you, if you're trying to tell your customers how to do your business, that's a really long cycle idea. So I would not recommend it. Um, and luckily for me, at Cree, despite the fact that the CEO says don't do something, you're also encouraged, if you have a really good idea, keep working on it. And so there's a brilliant scientist at Cree who, behind the scenes, never gave up on the idea we needed our own light bulb. And uh, about, uh, so last March, the previous March, he had come up with an idea how to make an LED light bulb that was incredibly novel. It was in very low cost, very high efficiency. But the most amazing thing was it looked just like the old light bulb. And so he presented it to one of the founders. So you should know that most of the Cree founders still work there. And while I am the CEO, they still think of themselves as the founders. And so one of them saw it, Neil Hunter, and he came to me and said, look, I know you said we're not doing a light bulb, but you got to take a look at this. And in that moment of getting a chance to see the product for the first time, despite the fact that we weren't doing it, it was so obvious. You finally had this. It was actually a light bulb. For the first time, you can imagine putting yourself in that consumer's shoes and saying, we could do it. And not only did we have the performance and did it look like a light bulb, we were pretty sure we could make it for $10. And at the time, most LED light bulbs sold for $20 to $30. And we knew that that was a magic number because over the years, it became quite obvious, for those of you who aren't familiar, in retail, especially in a home improvement store, $9.99 is the magic number. And people buy something. I forget what the number is, an order of magnitude more often at just under $10 than they would at even $11.
And so this was well known, and we kind of knew this, but it was so far away, we just never thought it was possible. But he had invented a product that was going to make that happen. So we said, wow, we got to do this. The other thing that became apparent was is that it probably still wasn't going to make much money. And so there's still a problem, right? Korea is for profit. Our investors are quite interested in those profits. <laughs> and so how are you going to get your head around it? And the, the second piece that came together was the realization that this was going to be the answer to our brand problem. So we couldn't afford to build brand and spend a billion dollars a year over the next five years and do it the old fashioned way. But we could sell LED light bulbs. And as long as they paid for the cost of doing all the marketing and advertising, we'd effectively be building a brand by selling the product. And so our low margin light bulb strategy became what I like to say is a high margin brand strategy. And that sounds like a bit of a play on words, but for anyone who's ever built a brand, if you could actually build a brand with a product that pays for itself along the way, this is an incredible, it's probably the most profitable way you'll ever do that. And so we went off and launched down that road. Now, the reason I like to show the ad is our competitors were a couple small companies, General Electric, you might have heard of them, um, <laughs> Philips, and Osram Sylvania. Here you know of them as Sylvania around the world. They're known as Osram. Between the three companies, I think they've been in the business roughly 300 years combined. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, started GE. They're pretty famous for that. In fact, up until we invented, uh, launched our light bulb, they were known to have the best LED light bulb in the market. They didn't make one. They have such a brand strength that people assumed they had the LED light bulb. <laughs> and so we're out there trying to say, we're going to launch into this market. How do you do this? Well, you needed a great product. We had one of those, thanks to our scientists. We needed a great partner. And luckily, the team at Cree had figured out how to get Home Depot to decide to put this in all 2,000 of their stores. And we needed a marketing campaign that would get people's attention. And so we did some pretty unusual things. We ran ads and buried light bulbs because what we realized is, is lighting is a category that's so low interest. And people don't think about it. You had to create a conversation that no one was paying attention to, and which is the genesis of the whole creative campaign. The results are, for those of you who like marketing numbers, when we launched the bulb a month later, we measured two things, share of voice for both the LED bulb category and the LED lighting category. In LED bulbs, we went from zero, no share of voice. One month later, we had 80% over all those brands. And we had increased the conversation by a factor of two and a half, percent, two and a half times. What that means is we not only had 80% of the conversation, but there were two and a half times more people writing and talking about LED bulbs after we announced ours than before. And the effect we were looking for was that to flow into the commercial lighting business. We went from 10% share of voice to 60. Now, that's something you have to keep doing. But to us, that was an amazing, it, it became just amazing that something as simple as an LED bulb could do that for us. And you know, there's a lot of theories on why that happened. And for those of you who like to study marketing, you probably should come look at the data, because we'd only look at it probably only about half as much as we should. But uh, you know, I think what, it's, what it did for me is I had spent many years trying to sell the Cree story. We've invented much more sophisticated technology. We've done things in material science that have never been done anywhere in the world and still aren't today. And no one would talk about them. And what the light bulb is, is that it's a product, but it's a symbol of something even bigger than that. Think about the concept of a cartoon and a good idea. The representation was a light bulb. We had actually changed a symbol of innovation from one technology to the next. And it's part of the reason why our share of voice in our marketing campaign was so successful. You know about the TV ads, but what really did it was all the PR. It was the fact that we created a conversation for people to talk about. All those numbers don't come from running ads. And it's great to run ads, and it's a lot of fun. But the fact is, you've got to get other people talking about your products. And we changed the category. And so it's been an amazing uh, journey to get into the consumer business. Lots of challenges ahead of us. And what I'm going to do now is switch gears on you. Because as I started to prepare for this talk, I could tell you Cree business stories all day long. But what became apparent to me is that the challenge we're facing isn't a product challenge. It's different. So we have 7,000 employees. And we got here by being incredibly innovative. And frankly, it's our core competitive advantage. And the uh, realization in the last few years that's been quite different at Cree is, is that what we actually do to win is innovate. 
Now that sounds really simple, but think about our competitors. I have those three light bulb companies. It's gonna be hard to build brand. I can build brand, but it's gonna be hard to get bigger than them fast, and they certainly have deep pockets. The lighting fixture companies have been in the business 40 to 50 years and had deep relationships and incredible equity with the channel. There are a couple of electronics companies over in Asia you might have heard of, Samsung and LG, who've decided to get into the LED lighting business. So they seem like pretty tough competitors. And then there's this country called China that's decided it's a core technology for their country. So they're gonna invest in LED lighting. So here's Korea and North Carolina, and we think we're doing pretty good, and that's my competitive set. And what became apparent to us is you're not gonna outspend them. It's gonna be pretty hard to out-operationally execute them, and you're not gonna outscale them. But the one thing that all large organizations typically don't do well is they don't innovate, and that's inherently what we did do. And so the challenge at Cree became, how do we innovate as a bigger and bigger company? Because at the end of the day, this is actually our core competency. And so it becomes a unique challenge, right? We have 7,000 employees. We have to now figure out how to create a culture. We have a culture of innovators. How do we keep it going? How do you not let the size of the company kill this culture that started on in those early days? Look, it was easy to be innovative when you were small. It was either innovate or don't get paid, right? So that's kind of motivating. But as you get bigger, Cree's got a billion dollars in the bank. You've got to find a way to keep this innovation going. And so this concept, you have to have a strategy, you have to have this culture, and you've got to figure out how to get the people talents to align. And so we started to work on how are we going to scale this up. And it gets into some pretty interesting issues, which is you're essentially looking for people that are wired a little differently. Now, they might work in your own company, or they might work in other companies, but you're looking for people that are essentially biased to take risks. Um, as Dr. Bell likes to say, they're achievement focused, right? That's the most motivating factor for them. Um, as I like to say when we interview people, when I look at someone, I want to see someone who is unafraid of failure, but so passionate and competitive, they are unwilling to fail. And that sounds like some nice words, but there are actually, it's quite interesting. You can figure that out about people pretty quickly. Some of them work inside the company, some of them we have to bring in. But finding people that are biased to act this way is the only way you're going to be able to create this culture of innovation and do it at a large level. And, and the reason I say that it's the only way is because corporate America, in general, is wired to not do this. In fact, I would tell you that corporate America is all about not innovating. And, and the reason for it is, is that it's essentially a business about managing risk, not about taking it. And so let me give you a few examples. And these are examples I experienced over the last few years that to me, this is why I'm always looking for something different that we need. So three examples. First one, very large, famous manufacturing company. I have a great person on our team. He is brilliant. And he has worked for three of the largest corporations that uh, they're based in America, but they're global companies. Very successful. And he joined Cree. And about a year and a half into his journey at Cree in a, in a leadership role, he said to me one day, he says, you know, I know you keep pushing me to go faster and to try this, but I'm telling you, I don't think you appreciate how different this is. And I said, well, explain that to me. And he goes, I've spent the first 20 years of my career being very successful and being rewarded for managing risk to give you a predictable result. That's inherently what the job is. We'd rather have less risk and predictable answer, that's success. You're promoted and you're moved up. He says, what you're essentially asking me to do each day is take risk beyond stuff I can fully understand how far I'm going and deliver to you unpredictable results. And you want to make sure that I can actually have some good and bad ones, but the good ones better far outweigh the bad ones at the end of the day. I said, yeah, that's it. Isn't that great? And he goes, yeah, but that's just not how my brain works over the last 20 years. It's literally the opposite behavior. And it was, that's when it started to dawn on me, we're trying to do something different. So yeah, people can adapt to this, 
but this is a brilliant person who's actually a quite valuable member of the team. And it was the first time I could actually describe it back to someone else. Because I have to tell you, if you grow up in a company like this, if you show up when there's six million, this doesn't, you can't, the fact that this needs to be explained doesn't make any sense, right? It's your life for the last 20 years. Second example was I was interviewing someone for a job from another very successful company, a global pharmaceutical company. And his job was to work on the product development um, review team. They looked at drugs and they were trying to figure out which ones they were going to fund and which ones not. And I said, wow, that's really cool. So how did you do it? And he took me through an incredible process. And the result of his process at the end of the day, what he was describing was the key is to get rid of the really risky stuff and make sure you can guarantee this drug's going to work. And I started to think about that. And I said, wait, what do you mean? So essentially, we get rid of all the really high risk stuff because if it doesn't work, the reward system is against that. And so they'd rather have essentially incremental improvements. And Bob, this is a successful company. But it dawned on me, I said, well, you know, do you wonder if that's one of the reasons you guys haven't invented any big drugs in the last 10 or 20 years? And he goes, yeah. In fact, my other job was to work on buying drugs from small companies because they were taking these risks and getting them. And this is not a negative, right? Those large companies are rewarded by their shareholders for very incremental things and predictability but it's inherently biased against these core innovation concepts. The last one is my favorite. So when we started uh, launching LED lighting, you have to remember I was out there talking to a lot of people in the investment community, and they kind of thought this LED lighting idea was a little bit crazy. And I met an analyst one day who said, you know, I worked one time for a large global consulting firm. And it's interesting you talk about LED lighting because that was one of the questions we would ask people. So you would interview new consultants, and you give them a challenge. And one of the challenges was, what do you tell your client? If you go visit a client who makes light bulbs, and they say, we've got this light bulb that never burns out, what do you advise them? I said, wow, really? What, what was the answer? He goes, don't tell anyone. <laughs> what do you mean, don't tell anyone? He goes, because it would kill their core business model, which was selling light bulbs over and over. You know, let's face it, the light bulb business is not much different than selling printer ink or selling razor blades. Nothing wrong with the business model, but I like to point these out because these are companies that are some of the most successful in the world in what they do. And it doesn't make what we do right and what they do wrong. It just makes it different. And so the challenge at Cree became, how do we get bigger and not add those Whatever that is, those processes, those cultural issues, or the people that are biased to act the wrong way, how do we keep that from starving this innovative culture? And so what I like to tell people is that, you know, the first thing to keep in mind is innovation is actually not a Six Sigma process. You can use Six Sigma for a lot of amazing things. But I have to say, in my experience, the best ideas didn't come from any Six Sigma process. And I'm pretty sure if Steve Jobs was here, he'd agree with me on that one. So how do you get 7,000 people? to act like entrepreneurs. And that's really become the business challenge over the last few years. And you know, in the beginning, it's easy. You're small. You kind of are forced. Look, if your choice is put your desk together or you'd have nowhere to sit, it's kind of obvious. You should probably put the desk together and you get onto the next one. And you end up not spending a lot of time in meetings. So when I, you really get focused on what matters. Um, and the way I like to describe it now is, is that you have a business and a culture and a decision-making process that is people-driven. So innovative companies are inherently people-driven. They have processes. You've got to have some of them. But at the end of the day, you're asking people to make judgment calls to take risks because it's not fully predictable. In larger organizations, you try to scale up. They become bureaucratic. They tend to create process to manage risk for very good reasons. By the way, we're public. No one likes when things go wrong. I can assure you of that. So there's always this challenge on the other side. But how do you try to do both? And, and where we're going today, and, and I'll, I'll leave you with this because it's not the end. It's kind of where we're at. But it is we're trying to essentially run the upper parts of the company, the top of the company, the leaders. We're trying to make sure are entrepreneurs. Give them the flexibility to be people-driven, take risk, find a way to get predictable results. And at the lower levels of the organization, you have to have process. Frankly, you really don't want everyone in your factory making up the own manufacturing process each day. That is a place Six Sigma works quite well. In fact, uh, the yields tend to be a lot higher if they don't change process. Now, I would say at Cree, our, our operators in the plant and our technicians, 
they probably have a lot more say in changing the process than at most companies, but you have to have control. So of course you need that. You gotta close the books. You gotta comply with the SEC. We're gonna have all those basic processes. You gotta make sure the taxes are right, right? So there's a process that's unique in and of itself. Actually, there's a lot of innovation in the tax thing too, is what I found. <laughs> um, but uh, in any case, so you wanna have both of these things. So the key becomes, how do you find people that can do it? And so our challenge has been looking for people out there. And, and, and one more example about the bulb. So we have the bulb. We know it's the thing I said I wouldn't do. Everyone wants us to do it, and now we're going to do it. How do you do this and not distract the other 6,900 people who actually have to make the business run for the next year? And what we did is the founder that brought it to me, I said, fine, we'll do this as long as you take care of it. So, Fritz, you'll appreciate this. I gave it to Neil Hunter, who basically took a small group of people, actually three to start with. They rented a building, didn't put our name on it. We didn't tell anyone in the company where they were going. And they started working on the bulb in secret. And they invented it. They negotiated a supply agreement to be in every Home Depot. And they built a manufacturing line. And as the day of the launch, probably only less than 200 people in the entire company knew the product existed the day we announced it, and it was in the stores. And that's an extreme example, but the key was this was a absolute startup moment. They had to be able to take infinite risk, and I was the only control process. So the nice thing about having a founder do this for you, Neil Hunter, by the way, was also the second CEO of Cree. He understood the problem of my job. So every couple of weeks, he'd tell me what I wanted to know and what I didn't want to know, and I'd say, keep going. And he was able to recreate the same thing we did back in the very early days of Cree. He redid it within the company. And one of the coolest parts is what you realize is you can have both. And so our challenge is how do we replicate this? You can't always put people off in secret. I have to tell you, that's actually harder to do than you might think, especially here in the triangle. So you've got the Triangle Business Journal writing an article about everything Cree does. We tried to figure out how to get a third party company to even rent the space. Um, it didn't work, but we actually went down that path. But the point is, how do you keep this entrepreneurial environment alive? And so it's really about how do you find entrepreneurial people or people that are biased to be entrepreneurial? And at Cree, there's a different definition to this. I, I meet a lot of people, and so for those of you who are here in the business school, this is not a negative. But I meet a lot of people in the business school who want to be entrepreneurs. And what they think that means is you take crazy risks and you go for it and somehow it works. And the answer is it does, that's part of it. But when you do that in a company that's publicly traded and has a $5 billion market cap, I also need you to make the quarter. And so you're asking people to live in this tension of risk taking and driving the results. And that's been one of the unique challenges for us. And what we found is it's about finding people that are biased to think this way. It's not better or worse, it's just different. And so in our interview process, in our internal development process, the activity is really turned into what does that person what are their behaviors? How do they act in their day-to-day -day job that we can give, put them in a role to go do this? Or who's biased to think that way? Um, when you hire people from the outside, really trying to understand in their success, the resume, frankly, it's pretty irrelevant. So for those of you, we're always looking for great people, but sending me a resume does not accomplish a lot because I don't read them. Because I can't tell until I meet people. Because what you're looking for, and I see someone in our audience who, who, this is her story, but she met an employee one day, or person, when she was doing an interview. And at the end of the interview, the person had no qualifications, basically, for the job, but one. They're one of the most passionate people she had ever met. And so she hired this person, and they've had tremendous success at Creed because it's things like passion that actually make this work for us. And so it's great fun if you can do it because you get a bunch of people who are passionate and having a lot of fun at the same time. It also makes it really hard because what I like to tell people is that Cree would have actually grown faster if I'd have done a better job at figuring this out sooner. So we're actually people limited. Not people in quantity, but people who want to work in this environment, who can work in this environment, who can be successful here. And uh, it's an interesting challenge. Um, I love to tell a story because we don't actually know how it ends yet. It's, uh, it's an ongoing challenge and who knows, maybe someday we'll get big enough where someone will say, hey, that crazy guy's idea of trying to run a 7,000 person startup didn't work anymore, and it might not. But uh, I I'm willing to bet we can go a lot further with it right now because at the end of the day, 
If innovation is your only competitive advantage, you've got to figure out how to make that happen. And the thing we've learned over the years is that it is really people-centric. So with that, I'll leave you with one more old Cree story and then a piece of advice for the students. So Cree story, how do you interview for it? So when I interviewed for Cree originally, they made me play basketball. <laughs> now, the truth is they like to play basketball on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So if that was your interview day, they would invite you to play basketball, not because they had any grand idea, then they didn't want to skip basketball that day. <laughs> and so remember, these are PhDs from NC State. They weren't on the basketball team. So this is about passion and energy, not about skill. And so we would have these, essentially, I interviewed on the basketball court. So did almost everyone for the first few years. And while we were doing it for one reason, it's actually an amazingly great interview technique. So think about it. It's real time. You're going to be in a startup. Things are going to change. Problems are going to happen you didn't expect. Well, that's what happens on a basketball court. You have to react. It's not your skill level. It's how do you handle the pressure. If someone double teams you, can you pass the ball? If you're wide open, are you willing to take the shot? And can you help your teammate out if they get into a jam? And what's interesting, in about 30 minutes on a basketball court, you have probably one of the best interviews of how they will behave in our environment of anything else. Now, like I said, it's probably something we should have actually thought of when we did it. It was really about getting some exercise. But to me, it's another great example of you can figure this stuff out. It just have to do it in uncommon ways. So with that, I actually would rather take questions. That's my favorite part of this. So let me leave you some advice. And this is mostly for the students, because I always get asked, you know, you know what should we do? And I, and I tell you a few things. Um, and some of you, you heard some of this earlier, so bear with me. So first is, if you ever want to try to do what we did at Cree, and this is not my advice, I would say I think the founders would agree with this, is you got to believe that anything is possible. Because if you look at our business plan in 1987, there is no way, despite the great wisdom of some of our board members from back then, there's no way we really knew it was going to turn out this well. There was way too many problems we couldn't have anticipated. So it can be possible, but you got to believe it's possible. The second thing is that you learn great ideas. There's more of those. There's more ideas than anyone knows what to do with. It's doing something with them that matters. And so it's... If you've got a great idea, figure out a way to do something about it, because that's really what matters. And the third thing I learned, and, and I think the Cree founders would agree on, is that find a group, whether it's big or small, of like-minded individuals who are just as passionate about that problem as you are. Because in the depths of things going wrong, and you don't have enough time to hear all the things that went wrong at Cree over the years, it's that passion and it's that bond of doing something together with a group of people that lets companies succeed, big, small, or medium size. And it's been so critical to our success because there is, no matter how brilliant a single entrepreneur is, they'll never beat a motivated group of people. The, the challenge of arguing and debating a problem with other smart people gets you a better answer every time. And it's been so critical to our success. So find that group of people and then Last thing, don't worry about where it leads. If you spend all your time trying to figure out where you're going, you won't realize that all the fun is what you're having along the way. And the fact is, if you're going to get into a business like Cree's, a technology business, you can't predict the future anyways. Yeah, you can influence it. You can make the next step. But it's going to, you're going to learn things along the way that are going to be different. So enjoy the fact that it's a lot of fun. Because no matter what you get to, what you find is there's always another bigger problem. You know, we kept saying when Cree was going to get to 10 million, that was going to be the day. Then 100. At 100, we were all going to just start playing golf all the time. <laughs> and then 500 million, and then a billion. And it, it, look, it's so much fun doing this. Why would you ever stop? You know, we get paid every day to go take on interesting problems and really get to have a way to change people's lives, both our employees and others. And uh, it's just been an amazing experience. And, and so I'll leave you with the... The best part about doing this is the day that uh, we had an employee that had joined Cree early on, right about when I started. And she was an operator in the factory. And she had worked at a lot of other companies. And she came to me after about 10 years at Cree, and she was retiring. She was in her early 60s. And she said, I just want to say thanks. And the coolest day of doing this is the day she walks in and says, you know, I've worked for all these other companies my whole life. And because of Cree stock options, I bought my first house. And it's the coolest day you ever get to have. So. Anyways, I'll take your questions.
Yes? Pardon me? <laughs> How did we convince the Home Depot? <sighs> uh, the short answer is we got lucky that a couple of senior merchants at the Home Depot, when they looked at the light bulb, had the same reaction we did. Now understand, Philips was their partner, so this is really hard for them to bring in a bulb to compete with their partner. They have a long standing, and by the way, Philips stayed in the business as well. But essentially, there was some really great merchants there who looked at it and said, this is just too good to pass up. Now, the way we got that done was a pretty unusual negotiation, and we had a little bit of a hidden benefit. So one of the Cree board members is the former chairman and CEO of Lowe's Home Improvement, Bob Tillman. And when Bob Tillman saw the bulb, he said, I don't care what you have to do. If I was running Lowe's, we'd put that on the shelf. So we probably negotiated with more self-confidence than we deserved. Um, and I'm sure the Home Depot found that to be a little bit difficult. But he was so convinced that the light bulb category was ready for a change. We kind of had in the, our back of our mind. And remember, at Cree, that's all the data. I mean, that was 100% of the consumer research we had done. He said it's a great deal. <laughs> so we negotiated like we had really good consumer research. And I would say that um, we had some. But his confidence as a merchant made us know that there was something to this. Um, and so, and, and, what, and the, the big difference was, it was that it would change the category. That was the bet. That by showing someone a light bulb that looked like one, you would start to really move this category forward. And after the first year, by the way, the Cree LED bulb after one year was the number one selling LED bulb in the country and in the world, I think. I don't know about China, but definitely in the country. And that was from never having sold a, a consumer light bulb to start with. So it worked real well. Yes? Where do you see Cree going? I know it has some incredible technology and you do think some material research there. There are parts done anywhere else in the world. But you're attracting the attention of Samsung and LG and the entire country of China. Uh, Kind of what do you see? I mean, you know, like you've got the light bulb now, and you've got the LED lighting, and all kinds of commercial applications. Yeah. yeah so. Uh... Well, that's a question I ask myself all the time. Uh, the good news is, right now, we try to figure out what we're going to do for the next few years. So LED lighting, while we can talk about it, we're early. There's so much more work to do. And think about LED lighting that isn't just new light bulbs or better lights in this room, but LED lights that come with integrated, um, integrated controls. They turn themselves on and off for you. They dim themselves when it's bright out. Because an LED light bulb is an electronic device, there's all this capability we can add to it that will start to become normal. We can put lights in places you can't have them today. Most lighting in your house or in your building is limited by the technology. With LED lighting, we can put it in places you never had it before. So we think there's a tremendous amount of innovation around how you use light and where you use it. And then on the other side, Cree happens to also have some other businesses we don't talk about. So we have a power and RF business that doesn't get talked about at all. It does a little over 100 million a year, quite profitable. And essentially, it is a, another startup that's sitting behind the scenes developing technology that should have a, the same impact in the power and RF space that the LEDs have had in the lighting space. So we have technology internally. And what I learned is I don't need to know, I don't need to know exactly what the future holds. We just got to be directionally correct. So what I always tell the team, as long as it's either that way or that way, it could be over here or over there. You just got to know kind of which way it's going because what we learned is, is that it's not a single step. All technology changes. And this is something we forget about. We didn't go from no cell phones to bag phone to iPhone. There's 20 years along the way there. And what happens is each step informs the next one. And that's why I never try to know exactly what it is because until you see how the market reacts to the next step, it actually informs how the market will evolve. And so as long as it's that way and not that way, we'll be all right. Now, I will tell you, there's a few things that were that way, and we killed those, I hopefully, by now. But uh, it does happen. Anyone else? Yeah, in the back. So how do we create a management atmosphere to make people act like entrepreneurs? Well, one, it, I, I hope what you heard earlier is it's an ongoing process. Um, 
I think it starts with you want to reward people for things that are in the that lead to that. So for example, the employees that should get rewarded for the better jobs, the next opportunity, the bigger thing should be the ones that exhibit those behaviors. We actually have a performance management system that we made up. Now, not everyone loves the performance management system, but it's, I had a lot to do with this, so I like it a lot. <laughs> and it's almost completely values-based. So when we give someone a performance review, at the higher levels of the company, it's one little section on results, and 90% of it is, are you aligned with these entrepreneurial and cultural values that drive the behavior of the company? And then, frankly, you give big rewards. And unfortunately, in this day and age, stock options aren't as cool as they used to be. But I have to tell you, it is one of the most aligned techniques to create value with the shareholders. And the great part about a stock option is the employee doesn't win unless the shareholder wins. You get that option at today's price. You've got to create value to get something out of it. And unfortunately, for a lot of different reasons, they became less popular or not quite as well used. We actually probably still use them more than most companies because what you want is create a reward system, but you want a reward system only if it works, right? And the nice thing is, is shareholder value and options are pretty closely aligned, and so you try to get the right behavior. So it's a combination of all those things. But at the same time, you know the other thing you have to do is when you don't see that behavior, you have to do something about it. And that's the harder part, because you have bright people that, don't, that are very good at some things, but really aren't there for the overall company goal that really aren't there to try to make the big picture win. It's, it's more of a me than a we culture. And in those cases, a management and as a leadership team, you have to make sure that those people either adapt their priorities or you can't let them stay in those positions. It's an ongoing challenge for us. Um, honestly, that part, we got pretty good. It's how do you develop more of those entrepreneurs? Because what we're finding is the best way to do that is within the company. That being said, when you're going this fast, we all probably don't spend enough time looking for that today or developing it. And that's really one of the challenges for us going forward. Yes? Is it hard to keep developing products to basically reduce the number of times that your customers come back to buy more? Yeah, so is it hard? So this is the light bulb question. Do you, you, you invent a product and people need less of them because they never burn out. Uh, it, it was a challenge. It's pretty easy when you don't make traditional light bulbs to invent one that doesn't burn out. There's no downside, right? And so it was easy for Cree to do that and hard for a traditional light bulb company. Now that we're kind of in the phase of selling them, it's still pretty early, so that's not yet our problem. My belief is, though, it's not a light bulb. It's an electronic device. And just like so many other things, the technology, that bulb, this bulb will pay for itself in about a year and a half. So if you have a 60-watt bulb, you put this in, you get all your money back in a year and a half. So in three years, if I have a better version, can I convince you to buy another one if it does something better for you? I think the answer is yes. That's our culture and our site. I got to deliver on the first value, but the fact that it lasts 10 years doesn't necessarily mean you're going to keep it for 10 years. Most of your cell phones that you all traded in the last six times, or at least my kids that need every two years, the last one was working fine. And so uh, I think it's part of that. But we have to add those features back to it. Yeah. Yeah, so the blue laser was originally what uh, was funded. The government funded a lot of work. The original idea is Cree was going to make a blue laser that was going to be the future of what is now Blu-ray technology. Um, there was another company chasing the laser. They got there first. We were still working on it. Unfortunately, as we got closer and closer to the market, something else happened, which is solid state memory got cheaper and cheaper. And it became apparent to us that by the time we were going to have a laser ready, there was a different storage technology, and Blu-ray was going to be a shrinking market. And so we weren't getting there anyways. We could put those people on LEDs, and we knew exactly what market was going to be there. Or we had this market question, and so we made the choice, frankly, of shifting all those R&D resources to the LED business. And probably our lighting class LED products would have never happened if we didn't do that. The fact that the market went away was probably incredibly in our favor in terms of getting us to focus. Yeah. Yeah. smart lighting, things like that. Do you see, um, at Cree, kind of through your viewpoint, has any company really cracked the code, like, you know, your products like Philips Hue, Apple's doing uh, their home kit feature. Uh, do you think anyone's really cracked the code in that sort of niche in the LED market yet? Yeah, so what he's describing is there are now starting to be some bulbs out there, LED bulbs, that you can turn on and off with your mobile phone. You can change the colors on them. 
Um, you know, Cree's kind of had an industry. Yes, I think it's going to happen, but I think it'll happen differently. I think the market won't take off until we do something different. I find it hard to believe that I'm going to convince you to buy a router or a gateway and a bulb. What I need to do is have a bulb that works with the things that are going to happen in your house anyways. And so I think one of the things that's happening is we're going to see a consolidation of the smart home. And if I was going to bet, I'd bet on three companies, Apple, Google, and Samsung. They seem to be well funded. They're pretty good at this stuff. And between them, they're all, I believe, going to have a platform. You know, HomeKit is software, but I think it turns into hardware at some point. Google Nest is a platform. It already has radios in it that could talk to an LED bulb. And I think Samsung just made an acquisition will do the same thing. From Cree's standpoint, I think the opportunity is to develop, to develop smart lighting, whether it be bulbs or fixtures, but ones that integrate into that environment. I think that's where we're going to see mass adoption. I think just like in the original LED bulb, what you have is too many people trying to sell you widgets and not thinking about how's that consumer experience. I'm also not convinced that there's a huge market for changing colors in your house. I'm sure there's a few of those. Um, might be nice for parties and stuff, but the, one of the things Cree's focused on is that you know, the biggest market is the one that's right there today. 95% of all the light bulbs haven't changed yet. It's a massive market. That's the one we want to change because we think the person that changes that market or the, infrastructure, the installed base, they're the ones that are going to have the most influence on how the rest of the market evolves. And so that's why we're taking the approach. The other stuff, by the way, I happen to own a Philips Hue. It's pretty cool. I'm just not sure I can convince many of you to buy it. And so that's the challenge today. Yeah? I heard the energy manager at Walmart the other day speak about not having interest in actually buying light bulbs or wanting to buy lighting. And I wasn't sure if he was referring to Cree or is that... If not, is that a business you're interested in, like to sell lighting as a service? Yeah, so she, the Walmart guy was talking about effectively lighting it as a service. So the idea is if you have a light fixture that lasts for 10 years and pays for itself in two or three on energy and maintenance, there's clearly a finance model there for all you financers. That's really easy money to find out there today. So could you cook up a methodology where you actually rent the lights and they get upgraded on a regular basis and the math works for both companies? I think we're going to see some people test that. I think it'll take longer to do it than anyone thinks because it's so different. What I found is any time you change the business model that much, it's slower to get going. But there's, the math works. You, we could do it today. We could sell lighting as a service and save the person who buys it from us money and make money at ourselves. The challenge is, is that that person is typically a maintenance person or someone else, they're not used to buying lighting, and there's so many channel issues to having that conversation that we still have to figure out. We're working on it, but it's going to take a little longer than anyone thinks. Yeah? Was sustainability a driver for your innovation and your product, or did you just happen to see a market there and say, hey, I can make more money by being sustainable? LED lights save money by definition. Um, so the thing we invented had a sustainability benefit, but we didn't say, let's only invent things that are sustainable. Um, in fact, I think that uh, probably the reason we've been so successful compared to a lot of green technology companies is that it was very good for the environment. It does save energy, but it also makes economic sense. And frankly, I think any time we try to use only one aspect, right? Only a good social reason to do it. Those markets tend to always move slower. You no, know, it's good reason to do it. It's a lot of value, but there's a it's a it's a limited market set. And so from the beginning, we are proud to have a very green product that saves energy, but we've tried to never make it about that. It just that's an additional benefit to the person who's buying it because it saves money. And for us, we thought that was the best way to grow the market. So, with that, I'm getting the high sign from Dr. Bell. So, I'm gonna sit down. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the faculty and the staff and all of our students, uh, we congratulate Chuck Swoboda, marvelous CEO, and what he's done. Great, great presentation. And uh, one, uh, one observation I'm sure you think about is emerging from the industrial revolution and the growth of size of firms has been the struggle in leadership. How do you prevent a company from becoming large and then bureauc bureaucratic? And I think one of the fascinating things about Cree is it's setting a stage to discover how to lead large numbers of people globally that operate 
uh, entrepreneurially. And so it's a different model. And for students, I'd love to suggest faculty members keep thinking about how in the world that affects everything we teach and do. And for students, how you, you craft your skills and the talents you build and the orientation you have to adapt, such as not having a career plan and thinking about not worrying about titles or anything else. It's, it's about what you can do and how much fun you can have doing it. So there's a whole new world. I think Cree probably is one of the leaders, if not really the leader, that's going to establish the, some of the discovery and secrets of how to lead into the next next many decades. So we uh, congratulate Chuck. By the way, do you think he is relatively entrepreneurial? <laughs> so, and uh, wonderful to have him in North Carolina and have him part of the Carolina family. So thanks again. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, uh, Jerry. And thank all of you for coming. And uh, remember, if you'd like to leave a gift, uh, we'll have people in the foyer. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>